Um, I'm going to now introduce Dr. Jack Aubrey. Thank you. After listening to that introduction, I can hardly wait to get home to meet myself. Uh, I want to tell you a story about a uh, fellow my age uh, who took his grandson to church. Now, grandson didn't go to church very often, and therefore he was clueless as to what was happening. And at first, of course, the congregation stood and they sang a hymn, and the little boy said, Grandpa, what does this mean? Grandpa said, well, this is how we honor God. Well, after a while, the minister began to read out of the Bible. The little boy says, Grandpa, what does that mean? Well, he says, that's the Bible. It's the source book of our faith. After a while, they began to take up the offering. The little boy noticed that. He said, what's going on now, Papa? Well, he says, we give our money and our tithe to the work of God in the world. And just before the minister started his sermon, he took off his wristwatch and he placed it on the desk of the pulpit. The little boy noticed that and he said, Grandpa, what does that mean? <laughs> Grandpa said, not a damn thing. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to keep my watch on. There's no way today that I could possibly explore all of the venues and stories and history about Theodore Roosevelt. His person, his life, his career really is larger than life. So what I'd like to do is give you a, a view of uh, President uh, Roosevelt that comes through the eyes of the historian Ada Donald. Of course, we begin with his birth in October of 1858. He was born in New York City. He was the second child of four, and he was born into a family that, uh, that Ada Donald refers to as a cocoon. And what she means by that is, from the moment of his birth, Theodore Roosevelt had access, had access to money, possibilities, resources, and of course, a long line of distinguished family. His parents, are interesting people to look at. When they were presented with this eight pound baby, uh, the first thought that they had, ironically, was that he would not survive. He was a sickly child, given to asthmatic issues, digestive issues. In the first couple of years of his life, living as a little boy who was very much a homebody, there was very real concern that this kid would even survive. And in that context, his mother and father really demonstrate for us what a marriage can and should be. Uh, it was a marriage that was linked together by love and by commitment. It was a marriage that had clear separation of functions and responsibilities. It was a marriage that enjoyed affluence. But most of all, it was a marriage that was predicated upon moral trust, fidelity, and mutuality. His father had come from a long line of wealthy people. Theodore Roosevelt's grandfather had been a man whose name was Cornelius Roosevelt. He was an early financier, a businessman in New York City who became terribly, terribly successful. So successful that when each of his children married, he saw to it that they received fully decorated a brownstone home free of any kind of lien. He was also a man who was extremely religious. He was an old line Presbyterian. And for him, morality, responsibility, and faith in God were absolutely <laughs> essential. Now listen to this. His wife, Martha, or Mitty as she was called, came from an old family in the South, the Bullocks. She wore her confederacy on her arm proudly. She was quick to talk about it was of how it was that her family owned slaves. She endorsed the way of life that became known as the Southern Belle. And yet these two people, so very different, found themselves in a meaningful marriage. Teddy adored his father, and there is good reason for that. He was a bull-like man, 
of body, spirit, and mind. In the tradition of his father, Teddy's grandfather, he had done well in business. He was a financier, a man of means. And like his father, he was also a man of faith. But there's an interesting twist on that. He was a pious Presbyterian. He was an elder in his church. And early on in the city of New York, it was Theodore Roosevelt Sr. who became known as one of the most generous philanthropists of that time. He saw to it that orphans, the poor, the sick, the disabled, the disenfranchised, were provided opportunities to improve their lot. But as Dr. Uh, Donald acknowledges, while it was that Theodore Roosevelt Sr. was committed to philanthropy, he lived a life that was very far removed from those he sought to help. He did not identify with the downtrodden and the poor. He kept his distance, and yet he provided for them resources. Um, all of the children, the four of them, with Teddy being the second, were homeschooled. They were taught by their mother, as well as other tutors. And as a result of that, young Theodore, being a child that was weak and somewhat frail and sickly, at a very early age, he became interested in birds. And so at the age of 10, he began to collect birds and then learned how to stuff them. So can you get this picture of a 10-year-old kid living in this magnificent home in New York City, and his bedroom had become a museum of stuffed birds? And not only that, he learned about the meaning of life. He was a student at a very early age. At the age of 14, his father decided that it was time for him to do something about his asthmatic condition. It was a severe problem. And so Theodore Roosevelt Sr. had built into their home a full gym and he did that predicated upon this observance of his son. He said, my son has the mind for success. I will now provide for him the opportunities to have a body that will be able to achieve that work. The gym was installed. And by the time that Theodore Roosevelt Jr. left for Harvard University, he was a man whose neck was thick whose chest was barreled, and whose arms were filled with strength. And that 15th year in his life was also another milestone. His mother, his teacher, decided that it was time for Teddy to be exposed to Europe. And so she arranged for a trip that she and her son would take to learn about European culture. That trip lasted for a year. They traveled to every country in Europe. They studied its language, its culture, its society, its government. And so by the time that young Teddy was ready to go off to Harvard, yes, his body was ready. And so was his mind. He took the examinations for uh, Harvard University, and he had absolutely no trouble passing them. Uh, he fit into Harvard very well. He was knowledgeable. He was well-traveled. He was affluent. He also had great skill of language. And by the time he was ready to go to Harvard, he had already written his first book, A History of the War of 1812. There are some interesting sidelights concerning his experience at Harvard. He went there originally to study science. And during his tenure there, the curriculum of that department began to shift. It shifted away from what he called natural sciences. And what that meant was science that was hands-on, 
touching things as they were, to a more laboratory approach to education. And so it was that Teddy Roosevelt, Jr., Teddy, switched his major, and he became interested in history, language. Beyond that, he despised the boarding accommodations that Harvard offered their students. And so for the entire four years that he was there, he lived in a very fashionable section of Boston in an apartment which his sister, his older sister, Anna, had rented. He also despised the food at Harvard University. And as a result of that, he not only attended a gourmet dining group, he actually organized it. And so here we have this young college sophomore sitting down with these old rich men from Boston, enjoying a good meal. <laughs> While he was a student there, he developed a relationship with a woman whose name was, was Edith Carew. Uh, she was a member of, uh, of the Boston elite. Uh, she was a person of uh, attraction. And he decided that she would become his wife. And so upon graduating from Harvard, he proposed marriage. She rejected him. <laughs> and he was somewhat crushed. He graduated, feeling a sense of satisfaction that he had completed his degree, but also deeply, deeply troubled by having been rejected in the art of marriage or romance. And so he uh, turned to another woman he had met. She too was a member of the Boston elite, and that woman he married. Her name was Alice Lee. Uh, she was a strong woman with great abilities. Uh, she was early on involved in the suffrage movement, and it seemed as though the marriage was a natural. Upon his marriage to this woman, he enrolled in Columbia Law School. He never finished. And I think it's important and interesting to know why it was that he withdrew from that curriculum. He began to believe that the law was not necessarily just. And for him, that became a focus that became a goal to achieve. That is, the writing and the execution of laws that serve truly the purposes of justice. And so there he was, married, a graduate of Harvard, a dropout of Columbia Law School. And what did he do? Under the tutelage of Henry Cabot Lodge Sr., he decided to become a politician. It was an overt choice. And he began at the very lowest levels of that process. He became a member of the Democratic Committee of Manhattan. And his first responsibilities was to pass out pamphlets and knock on doors and see to it that voting was in fact achieved. He did that for about a year and that he decided it was time for him to run. And so he became an assemblyman in New York City. He ran a clean campaign. It was designed to deal with law as justice and truth as being unabridged. At the age of 23, Theodore Roosevelt had won that election and he went off to be the youngest member ever to be seated in the Albany State House. His tenure as an assemblyman in the state government of New York was not without notice. Early on, he began to challenge the relationship between business and politics. He believed that clearly politics was an art form. It was a calling. It was a way by which to serve. Likewise, he was not anti-business at all. 
He was in fact pro-business, seeing clearly the necessity of business as the energies of the economy. His issue was this. When you put those two things together, you're inviting difficulty. Secondly, during his tenure at, in Albany, he began to write extensively about how it was that the political process, as he observed it, was living on the backs of the people. And so he began to challenge appropriations. He began to challenge tax bases. And he began to share in the ancient adage of Thomas Jefferson, government has but one purpose, to serve the needs of the people. Uh, he won three terms representing his district in New York. And just after having been elected to his third term, tragedy struck. Uh, his wife was pregnant with their first child. As the pregnancy drew on and as the time of birth came, she was afflicted with an enormous kidney malfunction. And this young man, 26 years of age, had no choice but to watch his wife die. He could not face raising his daughter. He felt inadequate. And so he asked his older sister, Anna, if she would indeed raise the child, which she did. Just a few weeks after having lost his wife, his beloved mother, Mitty, died. And it was too much for this robust mind and body. And so it was that he decided to go west and become nothing more than a cowboy. Uh, he, he bought the now infamous Elkhorn Ranch, and he spent several years living on the frontiers of Western America. Uh, Donald writes that the years he spent in the west had two foci. Number one, it represents a period whenever this Eastern-born affluent man became aware of and in touch with a whole different way of life that had to do with the issues of survival, mental toughness, and independence. A second reason that Donald refers to this period in his life is the fact that he believes that in terms of all of the hunting and fishing and aggressive lifestyle, that Roosevelt demonstrated during these years, it was his way of working through his grief. Eventually, he passed through that period of time when he was able finally to return to New York. And when he returned to New York in 1886, he thought it might be wise to run for the mayoral position that was up for grabs. And so he mounted a campaign it was fraught with justice, truth, handshaking, and a kind of independent survival spirit. When the votes were counted, Theodore Roosevelt had lost. He came in third. And in the context of dealing with that defeat, there was a relationship with Edith Carew. That is the woman that rejected him in marriage. That relationship was rekindled. They married. They went on a 15-week tour, honeymoon tour, of Europe. And when they returned, Edith was pregnant with the first of the children that they would have. He was without work. And through some old contacts with his dad, he was asked to come to Washington to be the civil service commissioner. And so with his new wife and a baby in, in, in process, Theodore Roosevelt made his maiden voyage into the reality of Washington politics. He did a number of things while he served in that position. Number one, he felt that civil service jobs 
needed to be very carefully designed and screened. And therefore, during his tenure, he saw to it that the examination that was given for various civil service positions was upgraded because he believed that civil service positions should not be awarded by political hacks, but rather they should be given on the basis of demonstrated competence. He opposed patronage and believed in the reality of being able. During those years in Washington, the two of them, he and his wife, enjoyed life. They enjoyed the social climates of Washington. They enjoyed the sense of power. They liked being in Washington. It would be as a kind of harbinger of things to come. In 1895, he left that position, and he was invited to become a member of the Police Commission of New York City. Just a few short months after becoming a member of the Police Commission, Teddy Roosevelt was nominated for and became the president of the New York Police Commission. And in that role, he did a couple of things. He became infamous for what society called his night walks. While serving as a member of the Police Commission of New York City, it was his practice to walk the streets in the neighborhoods at night to see the needs for policing and the way in which policing was done. He also upgraded the tests and the qualifications for police officers. And during those few years that he served there, he replaced nearly three-fifths of all of New York police officers. His thinking for that was this. Police jobs were being bought. Police jobs were being made available through patronage. And he felt that if policing was to be able to perform its functions, it needed to have competence, and the salaries needed to be commensurate. That went over pretty well, excepting that he made one, he made one fatal mistake. Uh, he decided that the city's police department could benefit from a new exile, ex, ex, tax based upon saloons. And so he managed to get through the city council an excise tax on saloons. And not only that, he also made it possible to close saloons on Sunday. His calculation was slightly off. <laughs> he failed to remember that there were over, there were over 12,000 saloons in the, in the Manhattan uh, area. And as a result of that, he made a lot of enemies on two fronts, taxing them and limiting their hours of operation. And so once again, he was relieved of his command, and he found himself without work. In 19, 1897, uh, he was made the deputy secretary of the Navy Department. The man who was in charge, John Davis Long, was an absent secretary. And that suited Theodore Roosevelt just fine. His history of the War of 1812 had initiated an ongoing interest in naval warfare, ships, and how it was that a country would be best served by both. And so in the absence, in the absence of the Secretary of Navy, the deputy, the, deputy, the, 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 the man who was second in charge launched the following enterprises. One, he demanded that six new battleships be built within a year. In addition to that, he made sure that seven new destroyers would also be built. And in addition to that, 75 torpedo boats would be built. 
quite obviously, there was an enormous amount of anxiety because of the cost of that. And after months of trying to rebuild the nature of the Navy, he found himself once again a failure. And so he resigned his position. And he did an extraordinary thing. He received permission from the War Department to raise up a regiment of troops to go to Cuba. What is interesting about that regiment is the constituency of it. There were Native Americans, African Americans, boys off of the farms, inner city people, as well as some of the socially elite of New York City. You all know the story about Teddy Roosevelt in Cuba, the Rough Riders, and that infamous day when they charged that hill in pursuit of victory. In that one campaign, over 200 men were lost. Nearly 125 survived, but with some degree of, of injury. And for it all, Theodore Roosevelt was awarded the Medal of Honor. And when he returned from that adventure, he was nominated for and was elected to the gubernatorial head of New York's government. At the age of 40, Theodore Roosevelt was the governor of one of the most significant empire states in the country. His tenure as government and governor are important to remember. Number one, he sought once again to place a tax on franchises which had received governmental support. He did not believe that business should rest on the backs of people. Number two, he was concerned about the way in which state employees were recruited, then treated, and then compensated. He thought wages were too low, as well as competence was not as high as it should be. And so we set out to reform the state governmental working staff. And he did that with some measure of success. Number two, while he was the governor of New York State, he placed a tremendous emphasis upon education. He saw education as the bedrock of the state's life and economy. Three, he became committed to the notion of racial justice. He advocated for African Americans within the state workforce and saw to it that they were never recipients of racial bias or prejudice. Four, as governor of New York State, he set out to address the issue of women's rights in the reality of government. And therefore, he felt that women needed to be compensated equally with their male counterparts. Lastly, he uh, he really did undertake a massive, a massive uh, responsibility of trying to educate the New York political machine with the realities of life. It's kind of what he learned out in the ranges of the West. He brought that back to him. And they began to try to teach primarily Eastern Republicans about the diversity of America and the need for awareness of that. Now, if you listen to all of those things that he tried to do, obviously he made a lot of enemies. <laughs> and one of them decided it was time for him to go. The political machine of New York had had enough of Teddy Roosevelt. They were tired of his bombastic manner, his persistence upon justice, etc. And so he was invited to become vice president of the United States. Initially, he rejected that invitation. He did it on the basis of money. 
the salary would only be $8,000 a year. And he wasn't so sure that that was wise. However, other minds prevailed. And of course, he beat William Jennings Bryant in an election, and Teddy Roosevelt, in 1901, became the Vice President of the United States. Uh, Donald says that he, Roosevelt, and McKinley had won one of the greatest political victories of history up until that point. On September the 6th, 1901, uh, while Roosevelt was hiking out in the West, McKinley was shot by an anarchist. <clears throat> he lay gravely wounded and ill for nearly seven days, and then, of course, died. And it was in that moment that Theodore Roosevelt became an accidental president. In fact, it was such an accident that he learned of McKinley's death while in the mountains of Montana and he had to borrow a suit of clothes in order to take the oath of office. Um, the, the, the Washington newspapers were pretty unkind to him. This was a constant, this was a constant theme or headline in their papers. We now have that damn cowboy in the White House. That was soon replaced with these words. We now have a lion in the White House. Uh, while it was that he was committed to continuing the policies of McKinley's administration, <clears throat> there was absolutely no doubt that Theodore Roosevelt began his own administration. <laughs> He began to challenge, once again, big business, uh, malpractice. He was opposed to mergers that created monopolies, and that did not go over well. There was one little bit of information in the book where he challenges the Northern Security Company because they had a monopoly, and they were taking advantage of their position. Number two, he began to challenge the food and drug safety of America. He wanted to make sure that what we ingested, both in terms of foods and medicines, were truly pure and capable of making life better. He spoke to the injustice through the land office of the government as it was directed toward Native Americans. He was one of the first to speak openly about the enormous embarrassment and tragedy of the treatment of American Indians by white Europeans. And then, of course, there was the great coal strike. And he brought to that a compromise. The compromise said that they would create a commission. There would be more money for miners and fewer hours. But in exchange for that, there would not be a union. And of course, it wasn't until several decades later that under the leadership of John L. Lewis, the miners organized. He also dealt with a railroad strike. Uh, and he, he did that by suggesting that, in fact, the ICC needed to be in a position to be able to recommend what reasonable fair rates should be, as over and against allowing the companies to simply set them. The compromise was that if the ICC brought in rates that were not reasonable and logical, then the companies would have the opportunity to take their position to a court of appeals. And, of course, his proudest achievement was in the area of conservation. As you well know, under Theodore Roosevelt, some five national parks were begun and instituted. Under Theodore Roosevelt, 51 bird sanctuaries were created. Under Theodore Roosevelt, four animal preserves were created, and likewise, 150 national services. Forests were also uh, developed. Uh, he took a strong position on Latin America, and it was under his leadership that the canal, the isthmus issue, was first addressed. Of course, he took a strong stance in Europe, and the, and the infamous, you know, speak softly and carry a big stick, became his foreign policy 
in that he believed in fair treatment, he believed in courteous treatment, but he also believed in the reality every now and then to use the military. In 1904, he faced re-election. It was important to him because, you see, he had been an accidental president for almost three and a half years. And so he ran against a man whose name was Alton Brooks Parker. He defeated him soundly. He captured 336 of the electoral votes, and he was elected to a second term. However, he made a fatal mistake in accepting that victory. He announced that he would not seek another term because he, Theodore Roosevelt, believed in term limits. The second term was not nearly as uh, productive as the first. Uh, many of his uh, dreams and projects were held up by more conservative congressmen. And at the end of the, uh, of the 1904 election, 1908, he was more than ready to leave the office. However, he had very carefully chosen and then manipulated his successor. And that person, of course, was a man by the name of Robert Taft. Um, Theodore Roosevelt strongly believed that Taft would come into office and continue his work. In fact, he once said, my goal is for Robert Taft to become a younger version of me. Uh, that sort of fits into another little thing about th this book reveals, and that is that Theodore Roosevelt was obviously an enormous egotist. And one of his daughters once said, whenever my father goes to a wedding, he wants to be the bride. <laughs> and whenever he goes to a baptism, he wants to be the baby. And quite clearly, he could not imagine another president of the United States that was not in his image. That did not work out so well. And uh, the progressive ideas that he had instituted and dreamed of, Taft was unable to bring it off. He was openly critical of Taft during, that four, during those four years. In fact, he once said, I truly feel sorry for the man. He means well, but he means well poorly. At the end of Taft's uh, uh, presidency, Roosevelt decided he was going to try again. And so he entered the primaries, and he was soundly defeated. And it was at that point that a third party arose. You all know the name of it, the Bull Moose Party. And he became the standard bearer for that party, a renegade group promising a new direction, a new future, and progressive ideas for America. Um, the interesting story about that campaign is, while making a campaign speech, Theodore Roosevelt was shot by a saloon keeper. I don't know whether that's left over from his days on the police commission, but nevertheless, he was shot. He was shot in the chest. And after receiving medical treatment, it was decided that Theodore Roosevelt had not suffered any kind of pulmonary or lung damage. He was not coughing up blood. He was not in any distress in terms of breathing. And so it was that Theodore Roosevelt decided that what he would do is return to the podium with this bullet lodged in the thick muscles of that barrel chest. And of course, instituted that great phrase. It's going to take more than a saloon keeper with a pistol to bring down this old bull moose. Um, he ran. He was, a, he was an independent uh, candidate. And as a result, you see, he split the Republican vote. And when it was over, Roosevelt had 4.1 million votes. Taft had 3.5 million. But Woodrow Wilson became the president of the United States with 6.3. With 6 mm -hmm. The years of the Wilson presidency for Theodore Roosevelt were an absolute hell. He was highly critical, highly critical 
of Woodrose Wilson's inability to provide what Theodore Roosevelt believed to be leadership. Uh, he was concerned about the fact that Woodrow Wilson was so slow in terms of addressing World War I. Uh, he was concerned about the economic traditions and, and directions that were beginning to be emerged, in that he felt they were way too conservative and lacked the progressive dreams that he had envisioned. And during that period of time, he got so disillusioned that he went off on a trip. You know, he was a great guy to go to Africa and so forth. In fact, he shot, I think, something like 12,000 animals on one of his trips. And of course, he did it all in the name of science, because most of those were brought back to the States. They were prepared and placed in now the Smithsonian Institutes. This trip was likewise into tropical Africa. While he was there, he had an accident. He fell down, and he, he suffered a severe laceration to his leg and foot. That laceration became infected. It attacked his immune system. He was terribly obese. And as a result, when he returned midway through Woodrow Wilson's first term, he was a sick man. He gave some thought to trying to run again. But as his body weakened, his friends counseled him not to do that. And they, 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 they put their support primarily with another candidate. A couple of things in conclusion. Um, today in New York City, there is a police commissioner who has the authority and the power to run that department. The Office of Police Commissioner was created by and funded by Theodore Roosevelt while he was the governor of New York State. Secondly, um, it is true that he once sued a press reporter who had been awarded a Pulitzer Prize because he, Roosevelt, felt that the reporter had been unfair. But that is the exception. Theodore Roosevelt enjoyed a love affair with the press of his time. Frequent interviews, open conversations, photos. In fact, Theodore Roosevelt became so concerned about the welfare and the comfort of the press of his day that the room that we now call the press room in the White House was designed and developed by Theodore Roosevelt so that the reporters would not have to stand out in the rain and the snow. He also left a significant legacy in terms of his family. And I think it's kind of important to see that. His oldest son, Ted, became a very successful businessman. He was also a part of the landing force at Normandy. And he died rather suddenly of a heart attack in 1945. A second son, Kermit, became a businessman, highly successful but riddled with insecurities and depression. And tragically, while serving in Alaska as a part of the armed services, he ended his own life. His daughter, Ethel, became a rather sophisticated, classy individual. And she continued to live in New York society, but with an eye toward philanthropy. You would be interested in this, it was his daughter, Ethel, who decided that the history of her family and of her nation needed to be preserved. His son, Archibald, was a veteran of both World War I and World War II. He became a successful businessman, financier, and had a fairly long and enjoyable life. And then there was, lastly, Quentin. He was the youngest of the children, and he died while flying an airplane in World War I. You see the legacy? The legacy of service. The legacy of country. Um, as Theodore Roosevelt's physical condition deteriorated, he had more and more difficulties with breathing and pulmonary function. He died in his sleep in 
after experiencing a blood crisis that was a clot that got into his lung and killed him. What is interesting about the fact that he died in the night of a very difficult disease that had been somewhat diagnosed, the last thing he said before he went to bed that night, he said to his attendant as the man left the room, please put out the lights. We need to conserve money. <laughs> um, Edith died in 1948. <clears throat> they are buried together in a lovely cemetery that looks, overlooks Worcester Bay. Uh, he was buried out of a, out of a very small uh, Episcopal church there. Numerous dignitaries attended. And perhaps the most interesting thing about his death is this. When his oldest son, Ted, was told that his father had died, he called all of his siblings. And this is the message that he gave them. I'm just calling to say that the old lion who once lived in the White House is now silent. Theodore Roosevelt, <coughs> an interesting life. Maybe you have some questions and some options that you'd like to raise before we get to the teddy bear thing. <laughs> Anybody want to? Yes, please, Doug. Can I make a comment about Mark Twain said about him? What's that? Mark Twain was on the lecture circuit, both in this country and abroad. He had nothing good to say about Roosevelt. His view was Roosevelt never does anything unless it advertises himself. Yeah. Well, I think when you look at this guy's life, you can't help but avoid the reality that he had an enormous ego. But I think that if you look at it in balance, he was also a man who was concerned about the welfare of the country, but beyond that, was also interested in the most vulnerable in the country. During his tenure as New York's governor, to be concerned about women and blacks was way ahead of its time. Certainly the whole question of conservancy and the national parks development that occurred under his leadership suggests something of value. So uh, I would take, how about this one? I would take issue with Mark Twain on that one um, in that uh, I'm sure that Theodore Roosevelt was, not, was never a shrinking violet. But I remind Mark Twain that he did organize a regiment and did go to Cuba and did put his life on the line. Yeah? Yeah, but Mark Twain was a Republican. He was a Democrat. <laughs> Please. The book suggests that by the time he was in a position to run for the vice presidency, he had so alienated himself from the machines that were producing political power that he simply switched. I don't know that it was, has anything to do with philosophy or policy so much as it has to do with function and how it was that he could get elected. Nothing in this book, and I'm not suggesting this book is definitive, I'm just suggesting that in this book there is no discussion of why or how those transitions occurred. Others? Oh, yes. He was a distant cousin of Mrs. Roosevelt? That is correct. So did he or his wife ever like intermingle with them often or never? Well, of course, they were generations younger, yeah. uh, that, or I should say older, than Franklin and Eleanor De Roosevelt. But you're absolutely correct. I believe it was um, one of Theodore Roosevelt's brothers who was the father of Eleanor Roosevelt. That's how that genetic structure goes. Uh, there was clearly um, interaction between the two. I'll share this little bit of, little of the story with you. Whenever Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Eleanor were married, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was invited, of course, to the wedding. Um, there is not one picture 
at least that we have, of that wedding in which Theodore Roosevelt is not pictured. <laughs> um, he was uh, obviously, his ego needed to be involved there. That is the relationship. <clears throat> Others, before we go, please. Um, you said that his mother was a Southern Belle? That's correct. All right, how did she, how did the two of them interact with his, you know, his... Progressiveness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, his father, his father, his father was a strong supporter of the, of the Union Army in the Civil War. He was a strong supporter of the Northern development. He was very much a part of the Reconstruction period. Okay, so that he was not—he was not from the South. He was from New York. Um, his mother, Mitty, um, clearly was the Southern Confederate, the uh, Southern Bell influence, and she she did that rather aggressively. In the book, uh, Donald writes that Theodore Roosevelt adored his father, and he really did seek to emulate him. And he was polite with his mother. He loved his mother to death, but clearly did not agree with her thinking and her attitudes. But and there's another interesting thing in this book. It talks about how it was that Theodore Roosevelt Sr. and his wife, Mitty, had a perfect marriage. And the perfect marriage was this. They had very, very clear lines of responsibility. And in today's world, I think I would call those sexist. That is to say, she was responsible for the children, their education, their travel, etc. And Theodore was responsible for earning the money and being the bread keeper. However, the book is on to suggest that their marriage and their relationship was built upon Mutual respect, mutual affection, and certainly mutual support. So that, probably, while very different, they were linked together by bonds that are pretty significant. Um, Theodore Roosevelt did not agree with his mother. He adored his dad, and he loved his mom. In fact, his dad, um, his dad, while, while he was at Harvard, while Theodore Jr. was at Harvard, his dad sought a Republican office in New, York, in New York City and was defeated. And it was just a few weeks after that that he suffered this major heart attack and died. Now, whether or not there's a linkage between those two events, I don't know. But the death of his father had an enormous impact upon him. He idolized him. I'm sorry, I think I cut you off. I didn't mean to. Oh, no, I just, you know, he spent all that time with his mother as sure. her being his teacher. And then they spent a year together traveling. I just, you know, it yep. just seems. So I mean, he was he. Maybe they decided to agree to disagree. I think maybe that's right. <laughs> it's not dissimilar for me and my wife. <laughs> Anybody else want to offer something before we leave? Yeah. Well, before I go, I'd like to tell you a little story. It has to do with two Swedes, <clears throat> and they wanted to go ice fishing. And so they found this lovely ice. And Hans said to Lars, make the hole nice and big. And so Lars starts to cut through the ice. And he gets about a quarter of the way through. And this big voice is heard. There are no fish under the ice. <laughs> Lars thought for a moment and continued to cut. A second time. Big voice, there are no fish under the ice. At this point, Lars stands up and he says, who are you? And how do you know that? Big voice comes back, because I'm the guy who owns the skating rink. So on that note, uh, <laughs> thanks for having me, it's a real joy.